could omega-3s actually decrease lifespan and increase disease? We'll be answering that question in today's episode, episode 107 of the Energy Balance Podcast, a podcast where we explore health and nutrition from the bioenergetic view and teach you how to maximize your cellular energy to maximize your health. Today's episode is part three of our three-part series exploring the relationship between omega-3s, mortality, and lifespan. And in today's episode, we'll be going over the studies showing that omega-3 consumption decreases lifespan and increases disease processes. We'll also be going over the potentially harmful effects of omega-3 usage during pregnancy on offspring, as well as the impact of omega-3s on inflammation, endotoxin, and mitochondrial respiration. We'll also be going over the data in native cultures showing that omega-3 intake does not improve cardiovascular disease or mortality, and we'll be going over the extremely healthy populations that consume high-carb and high-saturated fat diets with almost no omega-3s. To check out the studies and articles and anything else that we reference throughout today's episode, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast, where you can find the show notes. And with that, let's get started. Moving on to some research that I find exciting, uh, which is looking at omega-3 consumption and supplementation in animals and the effects on lifespan and the effects on disease. So this is a situation where we can test very clearly what happens throughout the entire lifespan of an animal with an intervention like this. We can't do this with humans. You can't have a human that essentially from birth is given omega-3s and then you see what happens 80 years later with this huge cohort. But you can do this very easily in animals and you can see the effects on lifespan. You can see the effects on different disease processes and uh, we'll dig into the research showing it. It's it's uh, exciting stuff. Just a caveat before you start, Jay, there are there is a cohort of people that is currently taking omega-3s from birth all the way until perhaps their entire lifespan currently. I just want to say between formula feeding and then supplemental mm -hmm. omega-3s for children in their milk <laughs> <laughs> while they grow up, you know, the DHEA fortified milk and whatnot, that is currently happening despite the inconclusive nature of the research. That's true. And despite the, you know, research, you know, the conflicting research, research specifically on infants and infant outcomes and things like that. The other thing worth mentioning, too, I know you're saying this semi-facetiously, of course, there's not like a trial there, but we will be looking at populations that have very high omega-3 intake. And this is not in the context of formula feeding and adding supplements to food, but rather getting their omega-3s directly from fully natural whole foods like fish and whales, blubber and things like that, seals, uh, being the Inuits and Eskimos. And we'll, we'll come to that later. And it actually does also doesn't support uh, that even consuming the omega-3s from the right sources in large amounts is a good idea. So, but anyway, coming back to this animal research, we'll go through a handful of studies here. The first one is titled Dietary Supplementation with Lovaza and Krill Oil Shortens the Lifespan of Long-Lived F1 Mice. And Lovaza, for reference, is a pharmaceutical-grade fish oil. So, you know, top quality here. And then also krill oil as well, which is sometimes suggested over fish oil because it has some um, antioxidant capacity with the astaxanthin. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so they state here, they conclude that marine oils rich in omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids have been recommended as a preventative treatment for patients at risk for cardiovascular disease or diseases. These oils are also are the third most consumed dietary supplement in the USA. However, evidence for their health benefits is equivocal. Individually, Lovaza and krill oil non-significantly shortened me median lifespan by 9.8 and 4.7% respectively. Lovaza increased the number of enlarged seminal vesicles 7.1 fold. Lovaza and krill oil significantly increased lung tumors 4.1 and 8.2 fold and hemorrhagic diathesis 3.9 and 3.1 fold. Taken together, the results do not support the idea that the consumption of isolated omega-3 fatty acid-rich oils will increase the lifespan or health of initially healthy individuals. So, yeah, I don't know what, what more to add. We're seeing increased, you know, various diseases, uh, potentially reduced fertility or male fertility with those enlarged seminal vesicles. Uh, seminal vesicles, we're seeing a significantly, well, non-significant, but a large effect size. It was non-significant, but... Uh, large effect size as far as a shortened median lifespan of 9.8 and 4.7%. So it 
So, I mean, these are some pretty clear findings, and we'll go through some more clear ones, uh, suggesting that supplementing with pharmaceutical-grade fish oil or krill oil for a lifetime is probably not a great idea. Yeah, and, you know, just some minor bleeding and cancer along the way. Nothing nothing too serious. (laughs) Nothing too serious. (laughs) Now, again, serious. I want to, I'm making, I'm making jokes about it, but I want to make this, this doesn't mean that people are going to necessarily get cancer and bleed out from fish oil, but just the, basically what you're seeing is you're not, if fish oil is so beneficial, you're not seeing the benefit with long, a uh, species of long lived formula one driving mice. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Do you want to <laughs> uh, go through the next one, Mike? Yep. Um, so the title of this one is long-term intake of fish oil increases oxidative stress and decreases lifespan in senescence accelerated mice. So just a caveat before we jump in or kind of like an explanation before we jump in. The previous set of mice lived like generally lived a long time. And this set of mice has a proclivity to not live a long time. They have a senescence, which is basically like the cells move into a state of uh, non-replication and uh, kind of like this like limbo state, which is uh, usually sort of associated with shorter lifespan. Um, so these mice don't live as long. So we're going to see the effects of fish oil in these mice and the title already kind of gave it away. But well, it, what the research... Sorry, sorry, Mike. I think that uh, it looks like they're more prone to like they, they experience cognitive decline and Alzheimer's type effects younger I don't know if they actually don't live as long. I think it's more just that they experience those things They just things have the sooner. effects of the, the chronic diseases. Yeah. 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 It looks like it. So that they can study those sorts of things in a little bit more detail. I'm not 100% sure on that. It's It doesn't matter too much, but yeah. Yeah. Either way, you have a set of mice that where their cells move into senescence quicker. So basically like mm-hmm. uh, much less metabolically active cells that aren't replicating anymore. Um and it's usually the senescent cells are associated with chronic disease states. It's not a good thing. Um, yep. So the researchers start here and they say the the SAM8 mice, so these are the senescent accelerated mice. That's what I assume the SAM stands for. Uh, fed mm-hmm. fish oil did not have a longer maximum lifespan. It had a shorter average average lifespan than mice fed safflower oil. So there we go again. <laughs> the safflower oil and the corn oil are outperforming. Um to examine the mechanism underlying these results, the effects on oxidative stress of long-term ingestion of fish oil were examined. SAM P8 mice fed fish oil for 28 weeks, showed strong oxidative stress that caused hyperoxidation of membrane phospholipids and a diminished antioxidant defense system due to a decrease in tocopherol compared with mice fed safflower oil. These findings suggest that the in, that intake of fish oil increases oxidative stress, decreases cellular function, and causes organ dysfunction and SAM, SAMP or SAM P8 mice, thereby promoting aging and shortening the lifespan of the mice. So, I mean, I, the oxidative stress here is likely because the fish oil is has much more double bonds present in the fat. So we kind of already covered this specific piece, especially compared to the safflower oil, even though the safflower oil should technically increase more of the in highly inflammatory mediators, but essentially, and and these are mechanisms that we already covered previously, but the, the increased oxidative or peroxidative stress of these fats inside the membrane phosphate. So inside the actual structure, the, the cell membrane of the cells basically destroyed the antioxidant defense defense system, depleted vitamin E to coferol, and then decreased the lifespan and the cellular function and increased organ dysfunction for these mice. So essentially the, the way I kind of view this is if you build your house out of really crappy materials, then <laughs> the cells or the house will not function very well and they will have a much shorter lifespan. You're going to have to get your roof repaired probably in five years instead of 30. And so basically that's kind of what you're seeing with these rats and with the when you incorporate these highly unsaturated fats into the tissues um, in, in the form of the for this was in the form of fish oil. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're basically seeing the exact mechanisms played out that we were looking at earlier in those studies that were showing increases in peroxidation being associated with shorter lifespan, increased peroxidizability index being associated with shorter shorter lifespan across species. And they had then tested it. They gave those rats fish oil. 
saw increased oxidative stress and said, well, probably is going to decrease lifespan. And here we see exactly that. And again, we're not comparing fish oil to olive oil, to coconut oil, to something that's very stable. We're comparing it to safflower oil, which are which is very high in omega-6s, also very prone to peroxidation, but just not quite as prone as fish oil. And you see hyperoxidation of membrane phospholipids, diminished antioxidant systems, uh, as well as shorter average lifespan compared to safflower oil. So pretty clear demonstration here of exactly what we would anticipate to be the effects of fish oil. Yeah, and it follows the trends that we kind of already discussed with peroxidizability index previously, where the more double bonds, the more unsaturated the fats are, the more peroxidative stress you induce, and then the more problems you essentially have, especially within the cell membranes and the cellular structure. Um, the other thing I want to point out here, just uh, slightly tangentially, but a lot of people are, oh, well, there's all these studies that show that fish oil decreases oxidative stress. And I, what I want to mention here is that fish oil, at, at least from the mechanisms that I've gone through, is decreasing oxidative stress by creating peroxidized fatty acid mediators and then triggering hormetic pathways or basically triggering cell defense pathways to clean up the mess. And so the, the question becomes, OK, maybe inducing the different antioxidant enzymes, glutathione peroxidase, um, superoxide dismutase, catalase, etc., Perhaps that will decrease oxidative stress for a period of time. And but it's in doing it because you already have the peroxidation from the beginning. And then the further problem is, is that sustainable long term? Can you run a marathon continuously? And what I mean by that is, can you put a stressor on the system, on the body or on the cell ex over extended period of time and, and to get this supposed out this supposed outcome and again and this kind of goes into some of the hormetic arguments that we discussed previously but i just wanted to um put that in into perspective there because it's the uh, the, the antioxidation you're seeing is not because the omega-3s are specifically antioxidants it's because they're creating lipid peroxidate lipid peroxidation products that are triggering cell defense which is a completely different mm -hmm. mechanism than increasing your vitamin e or your vitamin c content yeah. Yeah. And we saw that earlier in one of those studies. I, I believe it was the one on salmon. But yeah. It, and we've talked extensively about hormesis. Of course, I'll, I'll be linking back to those episodes. But yeah, to say that that's a good thing, I think is like to say that it's beneficial to, you know, increase antioxidant defenses by causing oxidative stress is not something we would agree with. And, there, you know, we go through all the reasoning for that in those in that series. So I'll definitely link back to that. So moving on to the next uh, paper here. It's titled Excess Omega-3 Fatty Acid Consumption by Mothers During Pregnancy and Lactation Caused Shorter Lifespan and Abnormal ABRs in Old Adult Offspring. So the first quote here, they state the excess offspring, and this is excess meaning excess fatty acid consumption. And then when they say control, it's a normal amount of, fatty acid, of omega-3s and then deficient is deficient in omega-3s. So these are the three groups that they're comparing. So they state the excess offspring excess omega-3 offspring had shorter lifespans compared to their control and deficient cohorts. And this is uh, 506 days on average for the excess, 601 for the control, and 585 for deficient, which is a difference between the excess and control of 16%, I believe, about 15, 16%. So a huge difference in lifespan between those two groups. Uh, when the study terminated on postnatal day 640, the excess offspring had a higher incidence of uh, pres by cussis than the control and deficient groups a difference of so it was 33.3 percent for the excess and then the control was 4.3 and deficient was 4.5 percent so we're talking about an eight times difference there uh, about and a persistence of other sensory neurological abnormalities and lower body weights in old adulthood so that is quite concerning <laughs> to see the effects of excess amounts of omega threes in, in of offspring. So again, this is looking at what happens when the parent is fed, the the mother is fed excess omega threes. So the presbycusis is uh, age related hearing loss. Just for anyone who's on doesn't know the term, it's a just a medical term. Yeah, yeah, and seeing major major effects here. I mean, huge percentage differences. Uh, in yeah. lifespan and, and also in, in these sorts of uh, disorders, neurological disorders and things. It's also interesting that the deficient 
didn't have such decrease compared to control. Like it was right. marginally less, at least on a percentage basis, in comparison to the excess versus the control. Right. Yeah, you're saying in in uh in, in lifespan? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So 601 days for control, 585 for deficient, so a little bit less, although not sure if the difference I don't think the difference between those two is significant actually. Uh not 100 percent sure. And then looking at the excess, it was five hundred six days. So a huge, huge difference there. Yeah. Uh massive difference. Moving on to the next what's that? Mass it's a massive difference. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, so moving on to the the next quote here, they state post hoc comparisons indicated that the excess offspring weighed significantly less than their control and deficient cohorts, whereas the control and deficient offspring did not differ from each other. So again, now we're saying just in birth weight, or sorry, not birth weight, but the final weight of the offspring. So their general body weight is considerably lower when they have excess amounts of omega threes, which is a sign of of major issues with development. And then they conclude, they state, in conclusion, omega-3 fatty acid overnutrition or imbalance during pregnancy and lactation had adverse effects on lifespan and sensory neurological function in old adulthood. The adverse outcomes in the excess offspring were likely due to a nutritional toxicity during fetal and or neonatal development that programmed them for lifelong health disorders. The health implication is that consuming or administering large amounts of omega-3 fatty acids during pregnancy and lactation seems inadvisable inadvisable because of adverse effects on the offspring. Uh, so yeah, I don't know if there's too much to, that I want to add there. It's so clear based on what they said and incredibly concerning. Yeah. I mean, basically I, I think the solution here from my perspective is that my children are going to get high omega three formula. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, sounds like a great idea. Yep, it's that and the the omega three enriched eggs throughout all of the uh, all of their childhood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, and and fish oil and salmon and all that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, fish oil, um, and fish oil gummies, and everything else. Fish oil. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Uh, so I do want to move on to two studies that are not looking at lifespan changes in animals, but instead are looking at different disease processes and other effects that you can see uh, in animals that are fed lifelong uh, high amounts of fish oil versus other fats. And I think this is some evidence that we've talked to a bit earlier, but some very clear and important things to go through. Do you want to share this first one, Mike? Yeah, I think these come from the the fatty liver, some of the fatty liver studies we did, correct? Yeah, we or, probably uh, did episodes. talk about... Yeah, we definitely talked about uh, both of these during the fatty liver episodes, yeah. Okay. It's clear that omega-3s are not the answer, but you may not know what the answer is if you're looking to optimally support your metabolism and lose weight, improve your digestion, get amazing sleep, rebalance your hormones, boost your energy, and so much more. And that's one of the main goals of the Energy Balance Solution, a program that's designed to help you accomplish exactly those things with clear action steps and strategies, along with personalized guidance from me. So head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash solution, where you can find all the information for the Energy Balance Solution program. This program includes customized health coaching, a video library with videos on restoring gut health, losing weight without destroying your metabolism, how to boost your metabolism, how to get amazing restorative sleep, how to rebalance your hormones, and tons more. It also includes resources like a sample meal plan and supplement guide, as well as a private community. So head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash solution to check out all the details. Uh, the first study here is titled Gene Pathways Associated with Mitochondrial Function, Oxidative Stress, and Telomere Length are Differentially Expressed in the Liver of Rats Fed Lifelong on Virgin oil, Olive, Sunflower, or Fish Oils. Um, well, they, they start out here and they say, this study investigates the effect of lifelong intake of different fat sources rich in monounsaturated, so that's virgin olive oil, N6 polyunsaturated, so that's sunflower oil, or N3 polyunsaturated fish oil fatty acids in the aged liver. Virgin ol olive oil led to the lowest oxidation in ultrastructural, ultrastructural alterations, so that's kind of the, the structure of the liver of the cells. Sunflower oil induced fibrosis, ultrastructural alterations, and high oxidation. Fish oil intensified oxidation, oxidation associated with age. 
lowered electron transport chain activity and enhanced enhanced the relative telomere length. According to the results, virgin olive oil might be considered the dietary fat source that best preserves the liver during the aging process. The lipid profile was, an analy- was analyzed in the liver mitochondrial membrane since we have previously demonstrated that this is a good marker of dietary fat intervention at different tissue levels, including liver, brain, heart, and skeletal muscle. The lipid profile resembled that of the original composition of oils used in the diet with animals fed on virgin olive oil showing the highest percent percentage on oleic acid. Those fed on sunflower oil having the highest percentage of linoleic acid and animals fed on fish oil registering the highest percentage in doxohexanoic acid. So the linoleic acid is omega-6 and the, doc, the, the, the docosohexanoic acid is omega-3. And an oleic acid is a monounsaturated fatty acid. So olive oil is very high in the oleic acid. Sunflower oil is very high in linoleic acid. And then fish oil is obviously the fat that's very high in docosahexanoic acid, otherwise known as DHA. And basically the, the, the liver um, or the mitochondrial, the liver mitochondrial membranes reflected the actual fatty acid composition Within obviously we talked about there's a particular range, but you could tell which which mouse had which type of fat when looking at the liver mitochondrial membranes because of the change in percentage of these major fatty acids. And essentially what you're seeing, what is the out the outcome of these changes is the virgin olive oil, the the rats fed virgin olive oil, they actually did pretty well overall. They didn't really have a high amount of oxidative stress or oxidative damage. And the actual structure of the cells of the mitochondria of the liver were fine. Whereas the fish that had the sunflower oil, they had fibrosis. So fibrosis is usually damage to the cellular structure and then a replacement with just collagenous tissue or basically inactive tissue, tissue that doesn't really do anything. It's usually indicative of a damage. Uh, And then they had higher high levels of oxidation and then they had the ultrastructural alterations as well. So the cellular structure was not really what it should be. Um, it was a bit damaged. And then the fish oil had probably the worst oxidation, uh, at least implied by what they're saying here. And then the, interestingly enough is the electron transport chain activity, the actual flow of electrons in the mitochondria to produce ATP was decreased in the fish oil. Specifically, <laughs> they note this here which is very interesting overall. And, but it also makes sense with the mechanisms that we've discussed previously where incorporating fish oil into the membrane actually dissipates the proton gradient and then leads to issues with production and ATP. Um, so, and it also in, makes the, the membranes very susceptible to oxidative stress, which you're also seeing here overall. So basically, the, I guess if you want to think about this very simply, all oil performed the, perform the best safflower or, or sunflower oil perform the second best and then fish oil perform the worst of these three fatty acids and basically what you're seeing is a monounsaturated versus an omega-6 polyunsaturated versus an omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid yeah yeah and it's demonstrating very clearly a lot of the mechanisms that we had discussed earlier increased oxidation and the extreme disruption in electron transport chain activity. There was also a major decrease in mitochondrial density in the fish oil group. So yeah, definitely not outcomes that we're looking for in any intervention. And uh, yeah, pretty clear to see here when you're looking at lifelong consumption of fish oil in these, in these uh, animals. Yeah. And it, again, it's not to say that this is exactly what happens in humans because there's a diff- there's a degree of difference. Although the cellular structures are indeed um, relatively similar to some extent between humans and mice, but the overall picture here is you, maybe you have this benefit of fish oil in with uh, uh, not fish oil. You have this benefit of omega threes with the RBC phospholipids. And so you're thinking, oh, I'm going to go take fish oil. But when you start to see information like this, this is a huge pause, at least for me, because you're seeing such a start, a striking negative effect that's in line with some of the other cellular components. And then you're also you're seeing this in animals where you can actually test the effects across the lifespan. And we can't test the effects across the lifespan for humans. So we won't be able to see some of these things play out over the long term in humans, um, at, at least in studies. So. Yeah, this this gives that context for me. 
Right. And even though we didn't see it necessarily lifelong in humans, we did reference quite a few studies showing massive increases in lipid peroxidation, oxidative stress, uh, issues with mitochondrial respiration in humans when omega-3 supplementation was was used as an intervention. So we're seeing the same things here. This is not conflicting at all with what we were seeing as far as those effects. Yeah. So it doesn't conflict with the mechanisms. It doesn't conflict with those effects. You just can't really see the life the lifespan changes directly. <laughs> it's kind of hard to right, right. to parse those out specifically. <laughs> right. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And the, there's uh, one more study I want to go through here. Uh, again, looking at some effects on the liver as a result of fish oil, and this was also one that we went over in that fatty liver disease uh, series. And this is one of the Nanji papers. He's got a few good ones comparing. Uh, the effects of different fats and in terms of alcoholic fatty liver disease that are pretty uh, show some pretty dramatic effects in terms of protective effects with saturated fats and extremely negative effects with unsaturated fats, especially fish oil. So this title is uh, the title of this paper is Dietary Saturated Fatty Acids, Reverse Inflammation and Fibrotic Changes in Rat Liver Despite Continued Ethanol Administration. And again, this is one of those Nanji papers. And the, uh, the quote states, we investigated the potential of dietary saturated fatty acids to reverse alcoholic uh, injury, alcoholic liver injury, despite continued administration of alcohol. So they're going to cause a alcoholic liver injury, continue feeding ethanol or alcohol, and then feed different fats. Uh, rats in group one and two were fed a fish oil ethanol diet for eight and six weeks respectively. So these ones started with fish oil and alcohol and then continued with it. Rats in groups three and four were fed fish oil and ethanol for six weeks before being switched to isocaloric diets containing ethanol with palm oil in group three or medium chain triglycerides in group four for two weeks. So they were on the same initial diet, then switched for just two weeks to palm oil or MCTs with the alcohol instead of fish oil. And then rats in group five were fed fish oil and dextrose for eight weeks as kind of a control. The most severe inflammation and fibrosis were detected in groups one and two, as were the highest levels of endotoxin, lipid peroxidation, activation of NF-kappa beta, and mRNAs for COX-2 and TNF-alpha. These are the rats that were fed fish oil and alcohol the entire time. By the way, just, just for reference, they are using a fish oil and alcohol diet to cause fatty liver issues and alcoholic liver injury. They're intentionally, because that is the best, like that creates it even more dramatically and quicker. Then they're switching it after. So in groups one and two that stayed on fish oil and alcohol, they had the highest levels of endotoxin, lipid peroxidation, and all sorts of inflammatory mediators, NF-kappa beta, TNF-alpha. Then we're looking at those other groups, the groups that were just switched for two weeks to the other fats. So it says, after the rats were switched to palm oil or MCT, there was a marked histological improvement with decreased levels of endotoxin and lipid peroxidation, absence of NF-kappa beta activation, and reduced expression of TNF-alpha and COX-2. But they were still drinking. They were still drinking alcohol. Right, they were still having alcohol. <laughs> yes, they were still having alcohol. And in just two weeks of having saturated fats in place of the fish oil, there were these major improvements. And they then conclude that a diet enriched <laughs> in saturated fatty acids effectively reverses alcohol-induced necrosis, inflammation, and fibrosis despite continued alcohol consumption. The therapeutic effects of saturated fatty acids may be explained, at least in part, by reducing endotoxemia and lipid peroxidation, which in turn results in decreased activation of the inflammatory mediators uh, NF-kappa-beta and reduced levels of TNF-alpha and COX-2. So, the, I mean, there is so much meat <laughs> to these to these papers to these to these studies that Nanji did and he does you know he's done a handful of different studies uh, you know in different with different iterations of a very similar protocol but essentially what you see is fish oil is a great way to to uh, enhance any sort of inflammation and oxidative stress I mean, we see we've seen this in all the mechanistic data we see it in the animal lifelong data i mean it's pretty clear and it's very clear here and you see a very clear opposing effects from saturated fats uh, so, yeah, I mean, I don't have too much to add here. I do think that one very, very small tangent that I don't want to get off on too much, but we've talked about it before, especially in the fatty liver papers, is that there is some suggestion that saturated fats increase endotoxin absorption and that that's a negative thing. But actually, in practice, 
they do carry endotoxin in from the intestines to the liver for detoxification. And so in doing so, they actually reduce endotoxemia and lipid peroxidation, as we saw here. So, and they improve the response. They, they reduce the inflammation cascade and oxidative stress cascade. So they actually have a very protective effect, and I would not at all be concerned about saturated fats increasing endotoxin absorption or anything like that, which sometimes is, is thrown around a bit. But yeah, do you have anything to add to this one, Mike? Yeah, I mean, so there's, a, there's two major pieces. You already kind of, you pretty much covered the one that I wanted to talk about was that saturated fat caveat, because I get that one a lot. Um, and uh -huh. if anybody's interested, you can go in PubMed and you can find some studies where prior to inducing endotoxemia or shock, if they feed the rats a bunch of cream or something along those lines, it actually protects them from the sepsis yeah. uh, or the endotoxemia. I'll link to that study because we've, yeah. we've referenced it a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, and then the next piece I want to talk about here, we kind of covered this, this general idea previously, but inside fatty liver, there's this model they call, I think it's the two hit or the multiple hit model. I think that's the correct term for it. But essentially when you, when you load the liver up or you, and this is kind of like a analogy for other tissues or an example for other tissues, if you load these tissues up with tons of polyunsaturated fatty acids, and then you add a negative stimulus to those tissues now you get a very negative outcome because you have a whole bunch of very readily oxidizable fatty acids that if you have a stress response, if you're exposed to epinephrine, if you're exposed to cortisol and you have to ramp up fatty acid oxidation, you have increased ROS and all your structure is incorporating all these, these different uh, unsaturated fats or highly unsaturated fats. Well, now you're likely to damage those fats inside the membrane. Or if you have an exposure to endotoxin or an immune stimulant or alcohol or anything along those lines, it's basically you have a whole bunch of dynamite laying around and you light the match. So that's the the, mul the two hit or the multiple hit model from fatty liver, the theory that they look to. And basically what they're talking about with that is the conversion of just regular fatty liver to actually uh, like a steatohepatitis hepatitis or an inflammatory response to the liver. One of the things that determines that is unsaturated fat content. But I think that's also an example for other tissues overall. And I think it's an important way or lens to kind of think about what happens when you fill your structure up with a bunch of unsaturated fatty acids. And then you're basically seeing this play out here inside the rat studies. And then the, the endotoxin piece is, you know, another tangential piece, but also important or saturated fat endotoxin piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All great points. And I did want to mention one other of the uh, Nanji studies where one of them, he, instead of continuing with alcohol administration, uh, does, you know, takes off the alcohol and then has the different groups where they continue with just fish oil versus the saturated fats. And in the fish oil group, despite not having alcohol, there was minimal improvement. They, they basically barely improved despite the alcohol being removed and continuing the fish oil. Whereas when they took away the alcohol and were fed saturated fats, there was major improvements, of course, even more so than there were here where the alcohol administration was continued. So again, uh, it just shows <laughs> such a, such a major difference in the effects of these fats and and in the the saturated fat groups without the ethanol in that other nanji study they were essentially they essentially came uh their liver healed basically to nearly normal so yeah um, i don't have anything else to add here this was that was all the studies i wanted to mention as far as the consumption of omega-3s in animals and the effects on lifespan and disease uh do you have anything to add before we talk through a couple other uh points as far in context as far as omega-3s go I would just say, if you're going to have a beer, just have some chocolate with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And some fructose too, to help with uh, alcohol detoxification and everything. I'll link back to points where we talked about that. And of course, in our fatty liver series, we talked about that uh, quite a bit. Yep. So I did want to, I, I don't want to go through the studies looking at fish consumption specifically versus omega-3s on cardiovascular disease outcomes. There's, you know, just a whole other uh, a whole ton of other studies to go through. And again, it's pretty inconclusive, similar to what we had discussed earlier. And we mentioned in that Cochrane review how there was no effect from fish. There's, again, some conflicting reviews there and requires going through all the individual trials and all of that. But I would say largely they're inconsistent and inconclusive in terms of showing any benefit to fish or, or fatty fish in terms of mortality or cardiovascular disease. So just worth mentioning here again, the most important point, obviously, when it comes to fish consumption, 
we've got a handful of different variables, but we know with omega-3s that omega-3s will increase the omega-3 content of the phospholipids. So if having a higher omega-3 content of phospholipids was the beneficial component, if that was the beneficial thing from omega-3 consumption, which is what is being suggested in those original association studies, if that was the case, that fish oil would be enough, it would be perfectly adequate to have all of those benefits. And it's not. We just went through all those studies looking at fish oil. So if that's the case, then we know that it is nowhere near as simple as increasing omega-3 content of phospholipids equals reduction in mortality or improved lifespan, uh, especially when done via uh, via omega-3 consumption. So yeah, that would be the, uh, the only small uh, thing I wanted to mention there before talking about some real world examples of omega-3 consumption or a lack of omega-3 consumption. But do you have anything you want to add first as far as the consumption of fish goes? I know we've already mentioned a few things in terms of uh, how there can be other benefits to it. And for example, there was a trial, which we won't go into, where they found that the only benefit was of eating fish was actually due to a reduction in the consumption of like processed meats and things like that, which again, healthy user bias is huge when it comes to fish consumption uh, as well. You know, we've mentioned it before too, in terms of those earlier trials. So. Yeah. I, basically, if you're not seeing the benefit with the omega-3 supplementation, I think that's probably like the, the clearest indicator overall. Uh, and then the fish, right. there's many other components there that, that I would argue there's probably tons of beneficial components to seafood and fish and that the omega threes aren't really the the major driver of that. It's just been how right. how things have been explained. I mean, it's ad nauseum, right? Like every single blog or every single website, it's like, oh, the benefits of fish see omega threes. It's like, oh, it couldn't be the protein or the micronutrients or any of these other things. It's probably just these like these highly peroxidizable fatty acids that help the fish deal with really cold water temperatures. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, that I, I think. Yeah, there's no point in really going into that, as you said, just because we already the main point to piece we're trying to look at is omega-3 specifically. Yeah, yeah, and omega-3 is in those phospholipids, and we know that omega-3 supplementation does accomplish that shift. So it does increase the omega-3s in the phospholipids. So yes, yeah, and uh, we've talked about fish enough, but the last uh, really important piece of context and evidence uh, to look into is the amount of omega-3 consumption in various native cultures. So we're not talking about omega-3 supplementation. We're not talking about uh, omega-3 fortified fish oil, uh, omega-3 fortified uh, formula feeding or anything like that. We're talking about a, quote, natural diet. And uh, looking at that and any benefit in terms or lack of benefit in terms of cardiovascular disease and mortality. And so I alluded to this earlier, which is the, the first of these being the Eskimos and, and the Inuit. And what we basically see is that this is a population that has very high omega-3 consumption from fish and seafood, and yet they don't actually have a lower incidence of heart disease despite this. And there was for a while some thought that they did have very low incidence of heart disease, and it was kind of starting out a bit of a myth, and then it actually turned out not to be true. And so this first study is just describing that, that they don't actually have any lower incidence of heart disease. And uh, they the title of this Paper is Fishing for the Origins of the Eskimos and Heart Disease Story, Facts or Wishful Thinking. And they state that during the 1970s, two Danish investigators, Bang and Dyerberg, on being informed that the Greenland Eskimos had a low prevalence of coronary artery disease, set out to study the diet of this population. Bang and Dyerberg described the Eskimo diet as consisting of large amounts of seal and whale blubber, i.e. fats of animal origin, and suggested that this diet was a key factor in the alleged low incidence of coronary artery disease. This was the beginning of a proliferation of studies that focused on the cardioprotective effects of the Eskimo diet. In view of data, which accumulated on this topic during the past 40 years, we conducted a review of published literature to examine whether mortality and morbidity due to uh, coronary artery disease are indeed lower in Eskimo Inuit populations compared with their Caucasian counterparts. Most studies found that the Greenland Eskimos and the Canadian and Alaskan Inuit have coronary artery disease as often as the non-Eskimo populations. Notably, Bang and Dyerberg studies from the 1970s did not investigate the prevalence of coronary artery disease in this population. However, the reports are still routinely cited as evidence for the cardioprotective effects of the, quote, Eskimo diet. So we've talked about this a lot, how, uh, you know, a line in a paper that might have no real basis is then cited in papers for years and years afterward 
uh, and you try to figure out where this idea is coming from and you go back to the original paper and it basically has nothing to do with it or isn't actually supported or in this case wasn't even looked at at all. And uh, it sounds like that was something that happened here with this this myth or story that the Inuit and Eskimos have low incidence of heart disease. And uh, so in this paper where they actually looked into that, they, uh, they found that the, this was not actually the case. And just to finish up with this last quote here, they state, we also reviewed studies that have assessed the prevalence of coronary artery disease or other cardiovascular disease in the Eskimo Inuit population, uh, populations in areas such as the Northwest Territories and Nunavik in Canada or in Alaska. The results of these investigations confirm that the prevalence of coronary artery disease in Inuits is as high or higher compared to non-Eskimo populations. In 2003, a thorough analysis of the incidence and, availability, uh, and available mortality statistics among Inuit populations in Greenland, Canada, and Alaska by Beauregard yeah. et al. also concluded that the totality of evidence from various northern areas makes a strong argument for, for high presence of cardi uh, cardiovascular disease in Eskimos. So a lot of words there just describing that essentially they were thought to have had much lower incidences of coronary artery disease and cardiovascular disease. And it turns out they don't have any lower incidence. And in fact, it's probably a little bit higher than, than the Caucasian counterparts. Yeah. I, th I think there's a couple things to keep to, to discuss here overall is I doubt when Bang and Dyerberg were going out and checking on what was going on with the Eskimos, that they were doing uh, angiographies and coronary artery calcium scan scans. Um, yeah. And I think there's a paper, uh, there's multiple papers discussing this inside PubMed. The, the titles, the specific titles, I don't know off the top of my head, but essentially they, they talk about like the way that they're determining the cardiovascular disease and whatnot is like, isn't they weren't really seeing if they had coronary artery disease or not. They were just kind of like trying to figure out if they actually had cardiovascular events. And it seemed, and some of the things that they were discussing was that they, <laughs> they may or may not have had cardiovascular events. Um, it's just that if they did have them, they wouldn't necessarily go get treatment for it. Cause there's, you know, you're in the, the tundra, you're in the Arctic tundra. <laughs> now the, well, the other thing too, is it, it sounds like they were just, look, they were, they had, been operating on this myth that they already had low cardiovascular disease and didn't even kind of verify that they just were operating on that and then said all right well what's their diet since that diet must be the key but actually the initial claims weren't true that there was low cardiovascular disease incidence yeah it, in the, essentially there there wasn't there wasn't uh there was a low cardiovascular disease incidence but only because it wasn't like it couldn't be fully tracked <laughs> So, of course, the incidence was low. At the without, time, you mean? Yeah, at the time. That was one of the big things is like, how are you really determining? Because even with the, the Katavan populations, I think Lund, Lundberg or Lunderberg was the one who went to go look at the Katavans. I, I think that's the name. He couldn't fully, I don't think he fully ascertained their cardiovascular disease risk. I think they did like EKGs and blood pressures and things like that, which doesn't, doesn't really t show like it doesn't really show if you have coronary artery disease or not. Like you'd really have to go like right. look in specifically. And then as far as figuring out actual specific events, like that's another piece as well, like heart attacks, strokes, et cetera. So they wouldn't, I don't think they actually, if I remember correctly, cause I did go through this uh, quite a while ago. Um, they didn't, and I breezed through it again for this, this podcast, but they didn't actually like fully look to see these things kind of, as you're saying, they like did some minor testing for it and then kind of asked around about the diet. So yeah, it's, and then it got repeated over and over and over and over and over again. Oh, and then it was like, oh, it must be the fish oil that they were eating this high, the high omega-3 consumption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Great points there and certainly important things to consider. And in this next paper, looking at the Alaskan Inuit, they do, uh, or Alaskan Eskimos, they do, uh, try to draw a distinct correlation between the omega-3 and the diet. So they're controlling for these things. So they look at just omega-3 consumption, and then they did do an ultrasound looking for atherosclerosis. And so we do have some data here, which is largely not concluding any benefit to omega-3s. So this is a paper titled, Consumption of Omega-3 Fatty Acids is Not Associated with a Reduction in Carotid Atherosclerosis, the Genetics of Coronary Artery Disease in Alaska Natives Study. 
So a population-based sample of 1,131 Alaskan Eskimos of age uh, at least 18 years old underwent ultrasound assessment of carotid atherosclerosis. The mean consumption of total omega-3 fatty acids was 4.76 grams per day in those without and 5.07 grams per day in those with plaque. And models adjusting for relevant risk factors, presence and extent of plaque were unrelated to intake of the 20 to 22 chain omega-3 fatty acids or total omega-3 fatty acids. So what they're finding here is that they actually did try to look specifically at this one marker of cardiovascular disease, looking at plaque and the diet, looking specifically at omega-3 consumption. And of course, that does help because the ones consuming more omega-3s are likely having a much more traditional diet. And they found that there was no, uh, there, it was unrelated, the omega-3 fats and the presence and extent of plaque. And actually just looking at the numbers, there are higher omega-3 fatty acid consumption in those with plaque versus those without. Yeah. So in this specific study, basically they, they did actually test it and they basically not showing the a be, a benefit with the omega-3s and on the cardiovascular disease here. So this actually clears up some of the other discrepancies I was talking about previously. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, as you, you were pointing out, like there's a lot of variables here. This is by no means like take this study alone and make a major conclusion on it. This is just a piece, a part of context in the constellation of all the others that we've brought up. So what you mentioned as far as all those other things is certainly uh, entirely relevant with all of this. Anytime we're looking at population data, and that's why uh, this is not the primary mode of evidence that we would use to come to a conclusion, but it's helpful to uh, to look at. There's... You know, we've talked about the Maasai. We'll get to those because that's, I think, one of the clearer examples here. Uh, but I wanted to talk about the Hadza next. Do you have anything you want to mention before that? No, no, that, I think we covered that section pretty well. Okay. In general, with some of these next ones, so aside from the Maasai, which we have some clear data on, in some of these other populations, the data is pretty unclear as far as diet and cardiovascular disease incidents, as you were kind of mentioning with testing and whatnot. So, you know, again, take all of this with a grain of salt, but it's still worth mentioning. So when it comes to the Hadza, the Hadza have a diet that's extremely low in omega-3s, uh, yet they don't presumably have any increased incidence of heart disease. So the men eat a diet that's largely meat-based and all of their meat is extremely low in polyunsaturated fats. Pretty much all the, the meat that they consume is from ruminant animals and a couple others like warthogs, which are extremely low in fat. Um, and therefore very low in omega threes, and then they consume small amounts of or smaller amounts of berries, tubers, uh, fruits, and honey. And then the women of the Hadza eat much more of the fruits and tubers uh, and less meat, but also have, basically have no omega three sources either. So presumably, and we don't have the exact data on the composition of their diet uh, as far as the fat. Uh, the fat composition. So we have the general amounts of how much of each thing they eat, but no data that I could find as far as the specific amounts of each PUFA that they consume. But presumably it would be extremely low in the omega-3s. They really have no source of omega-3s. And yet, again, they based on the data we have, there's no evidence of increased incidence of heart disease, but there's not great, uh, there's not great studies looking at it. So in this one paper titled Physical Activity Patterns and Biomarkers of Cardiovascular Disease Risk in Hunter-Gatherers, they state, we found no evidence of risk factors for cardiovascular disease in this population, and this being the Hadza, uh, low, i.e. low prevalence of hypertension across the lifespan and optimal levels for biomarkers of cardiovascular health. So and I, don't, I don't remember if that's just the Hadza are looking at a handful of different, different hunter-gatherers. Of course, this is not using very extensive testing methods to find cardiovascular disease, you know, risk and, and existence. But based on the data we have, it seems like despite an extremely low amount of omega-3 consumption, there's not any evidence of increased cardiovascular issues. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't have too much specifically to, to the add to the study there. It's, I think it's, it's another piece that's pretty clear. You're seeing you have a relatively healthy population, at least that doesn't have a high omega-3 intake and is not showing like tons of cardiovascular disease. And you can also see that to some extent with some of these other populations as well, like the Katavans or the Maasai. And again, there's, there is, there's always questions around like, how are we determining this like cardiovascular disease presence or coronary artery disease or anything along those lines or cardiovascular events. And it's obviously harder 
in these different populations because they're, you know, it's not for some of them, it's not like you could just go bring them to, you know, Mount Sinai Hospital and get the CAC scans done. It's you're kind mm -hmm. of like out in a very rural area and you're <laughs> you have access to like field equipment to some extent with this type of stuff. So it just interest there. It, it is seen within these groups that or at least it's understood to some extent that they don't obviously appear to have large amounts of chronic disease um, like you would see within Western societies. And then it's also very interesting here to see uh, for the for the Hadza here specifically, they don't as far as I understand, they don't live very close to the ocean. Um, and but the meat that they eat is all kind of inland meat. So it's not going to have a very high amount of omega-3 content is what you're seeing here. And basically they're they're basically uh, their diet is super low in the omega-3 content and they're doing OK, which, again, it's just a one element of evidence that's going against this idea that you need to have a high omega-3 intake. Um, and then their omega-6 intake is also not massively high, no? Um, right. It's also, it's going to be higher than the omega-3s, but but still very low. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, my point is that was uh, some one of the things that we also theorized. Because it's not like they're having their, maybe they have some omega-6 as you mentioned from baobab seeds, but it's not like they're frying their baobab seeds in corn oil, you know, or frying right. their warthog in corn oil or soybean oil or right. whatever the deal is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And again, we don't have the clear data on this, but not only is there no suggestion that they would have increased cardiovascular disease incidence, but rather it's, I would say it's much more likely that they have significantly reduced incidence compared to other populations. But yeah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah well it's, just it's, just something else to consider some i th this is a slightly tangential point but some people would argue that oh well they have a higher mortality this higher mortality that and i see that like the same arguments kind of apply to well people back in the day had higher mortality in these groups and i don't know specifically about the hadza but i do know for some of the other groups that i've looked at once you get past infant mortality and once you get past a certain age in these groups and it's usually a lot of mortality is centered for like younger men um i think after like 30 or 40 they wind up actually living to like a relatively decent age because they don't die from accidents or or things along those lines or die in childbirth or from like specific diseases so the the a lot of the mortality data i think for these different groups if somebody was to go and look at that or they were going to try to make a counter argument about it isn't necessarily a chronic disease problem it's more of like accidents or uh, attacks by animals or infant mortality or like acute disease processes that are likely taking people's lives uh, when they're like all across the lifespan. But probably when uh, particularly when they're younger, that would um, lower the actual average age or increase the the total mortality and whatnot. But again, we're trying to figure out chronic disease situations here. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and there's quite a bit of evidence too that the all of the extension and lifespan that we have in Western society is not due to improvements in chronic health issues and actual reductions in aging and improvements in, in uh like medical care for the long term, but rather it's more improvements in our capacity to deal with acute issues and prevent infection and or deal with infection and things like that. Yeah. Or even the changes in cardiovascular disease and whatnot that they're start that mm -hmm. they started to see recently as far as mortality and whatnot is just because interventions for cardiovascular disease problems like acute heart attacks and um and angina and strokes and all these different components have like the treatment for that in the acute situations has actually gotten quite good. Um and so like when mm -hmm. you know when a person has a heart attack and they come to the hospital it is like a, an entire processes or a stroke or anything like that entire processes to set up to immediately address what's going on and help to rectify the problem uh, as quickly as possible. And it, that does save, uh, I think that saves a lot of people's lives, particularly in the Western world. But it's, again, it's not necessarily right. because people are, you know, living better overall it, in terms of like trying to make the best decisions is that when they do have a problem, like it, it can be managed much more effectively. And those are very different situations and levels of prevention. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So there's, there's a couple other populations I want to look at. One is the Maasai who we talked about earlier. We do have the clear data on their diet 
and also on the red blood cell phospholipids. And we were seeing that huge discrepancy where they only consume, they consume a pretty low omega-3 diet, only about 1% of their total diet, of which 0.15% of their total diet is the long chain fats, long chain omega-3 fats. And despite that, they have much higher amounts of the uh, phospholipids. So we had that. Uh, in general, though, what it was pointed to there is that they generally have a low omega-6 diet, although it's still considerably higher than other populations that we'll talk about in a moment. And it's also considerably higher than their omega-3 intake. It's just a little bit interesting. But anyway, so they have extremely low omega-3 consumption. And uh, yet, as far as cardiovascular risk goes, they uh, or rates of cardiovascular disease, they're in a pretty good spot. So this is a paper titled Daily Energy Expenditure and Cardiovascular Risk in Maasai, Rural and Urban ba uh, Bantu Tanzanians. And they state several studies have revealed that the Maasai pastoral pastoralists in Tanzania have low rates of coronary heart disease despite a diet high in saturated fat. So we do, it seems like there's quite a bit more data for, for this population showing very low risk of car, uh, coronary heart disease. Again, they're saying despite a diet high in saturated fat, you could add, you know, you could say despite a diet high in saturated fat, low in polyunsaturated fats, and very low in omega-3 fats. So. Yeah. And I, I think the, I mean, it's again, a little bit tangential, but I think the Maasai diet also changed um, from what their previous diets were in the past because of the, I think like corn was something that had been introduced more recently prior to the initial diet being largely centered around the uh, pastoralist society. And then like some like hunter gathering components for tubers and, and fruits and different components uh, along those lines. And, and that's in the, in the last like uh, century or so with the uh, moving of lands and whatnot within Africa from the different imperial stuff going on. I actually looked at these for quite a while to, because there's a lot of these different population data that you look at for different countries has to be put in context of like the different time periods that you're looking at the information because of the changes in diets and customs in response to different circumstances. So like even again, slightly tangential, but with the with the Japanese populations and longevity, you have this like the entire effect of World War Two on the food supply within Japan that you have to take into mm -hmm. consideration where you're trying to understand what was the diet before and then what was the diet after in these different areas that had high levels of longevity. And so the same thing applies when you have a population like the Inuit or the Eskimo in Alaska, where are you looking at populations that are, you know, secluded in their particular area and eating a, a very normal traditional diet that, you know, that their culture has eaten over an extended period of time, or are they introduced to um the the food supply now that's coming from the west and the same thing with the Maasai. has their diet changed compared to what it was previously is corn a new uh introduction to the diet in higher amounts than than it ever was previously because of changing of lands or um uh, introduction to this food into whatever so those are also i think really important to consider over time with these different components um but it is also interesting to see over time when they look at these things that Omega-3 intake isn't that high, but total PUFA is still low. And then the chronic diseases are also tend to be on the lower side. And also the, I think for some of these groups, depending on where they're situated, the, they may be exposed to more types of either, um, uh, parasitic diseases or general diseases overall, infective processes that maybe other people wouldn't be exposed to. And they still aren't seeing like the the same level of chronic disease overall in some, in some of the people who are reaching to older ages in these groups. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. There's a uh, other groups that I want to talk about that have extraordinarily low PUFA intakes. So this is the Tokelau and Puka Puka. The Tokelau have a total polyunsaturated fat intake of 2% of their total calories and the Puka Puka are between two and 3%. So extremely, extremely low PUFA intakes. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's as low as you can find as far as native cultures go. And unfortunately, there's not great data on their cardiovascular disease risk. But the data that we do have suggests that it's much lower than other populations. Um, their cardiovas uh, cardiovascular disease incidence. But again, there's not great data here. But there's also certainly not data that they are dealing with massive amounts of, of heart disease. And you know, same caveat with these other populations we've mentioned. I, I still think it's worth, like, I'll, I'll share a couple of quotes here talking about their supposedly lower risk in terms of cardiovascular issues. But 
a lot of the people who are just to interject with this this an important comment, which is that a lot of the people who are suggesting that we should be eating more omega threes are people who are considering considering that we should be eating ancestrally, we should be eating in a way that's evolutionarily consistent, and we should be looking at these native cultures, we should be looking at what we were eating X amount of time ago. And there are these native cultures that essentially ate no PUFA and essentially ate no omega threes. I mean it's not literally none, but it's very, very low, about as low as you could get from just eating a normal food. diet, yeah. And uh yeah, and so I uh, yeah, maybe it just if that is the line of thinking that jives with you, maybe these are some things to consider a little bit more heavily. Uh, we've talked about uh, our feelings on that um, and areas that we think it's valuable and, and ways that we think it's really not valuable in previous episodes, especially those ones where we were talking about some comments from Rob Wolf on the bioenergetic view of health. So I'll link to those. But just a couple of quotes here on uh, cardiovascular health in these populations. So in this first study, it's, it's titled Cholesterol, Coconuts, and Diet on Polynesian Atolls, a Natural Experiment, the Puka Puka and Tokelau Island Studies. The influence, and they, here's the quote, they state, the influence these traditional diets may have on development of atherosclerosis is an important question. 12 lead ECGs have been taken in both groups, and the rate of subnormal Q waves was very low in both groups. The samples of adults on the two atolls are, however, too small for definitive studies of coronary heart disease and vascular disease. These populations are in the developing world where coronary heart disease is uncommon or rare. So all the caveats we had before, of course, this is not the clearest data that we would like here in the study, but it's the data that we have. And I'm just going to st share this last one before we... Uh, have you know we kind of finish up our comments here this one is titled the tokelau island migrant study prevalence of various conditions before migration and they are looking at effort pain which is essentially is angina and so they state effort pain was reported in 2.2 percent of males and 3.6 percent of females criteria for coronary heart disease largely based on physician's assessment of angina yielded rates of 7.3 percent and 16.1 percent in maori males and females respectively, compared with 6.5% and 11.5% in Europeans. These rates are so much higher than the Tokelau rates that granted differences in diagnostic criteria, criteria the Tokelau rates can be regarded as relatively low. So again, not great quality here. We're using different diagnostic cr criteria and trying to compare it, but the presumption based on the data we have is that their coronary, coronary uh, heart disease risk is likely, uh, or incidence is likely extremely low. But uh, you know, and again, this would be despite an extremely low poof intake and a very low omega uh, three intake, and a very that. high saturated fat intake from coconuts. That too, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah I've seen the studies. It, it's it's just frustrating because you can't like at this point because a lot of these different areas have now been exposed to industrialization and like some of these different products. You're actually starting to see the like increase in disease processes in these different areas that are exposed to these foods. And so it's now it's like really mm -hmm. hard to be at a point to get a group of people that's pristine, I would say, and like test and see, OK, we know you eat this type of diet. And then this is your this is your, you know, your angiography or your coronary artery calcium score, like all these metrics that we can look at and say, OK, so like there's a different picture going on here with these different components. And it, the reason why I think you'd we'd want to see this because it, it like would it would support a lot of different ideas around the mechanisms and in, in humans, as opposed to in animal studies. And it'd be like a more long-term approach, right? Cause you get to, you get to see what's going on in the hearts of people who have eaten high saturated fat, low, high saturated, low PUFA uh, or polyunsaturated fat diets for an extended period of time. And like, they could be essentially like huge disprovers to the whole cholesterol, heart disease hypothesis, saturated fat, heart disease hypothesis, et cetera. And then also simultaneously disprove this massive benefits of polyunsaturated fats, omega-3s, omega-6s, whatever the deal is. Um, so, yeah. And that's why, you know, looking at works of somebody like Weston A. Price, like extremely groundbreaking work, it's just, it's kind of frustrating because it, you don't have the same level of, uh, diagnostics that you would really want to see to say you know 
okay, these, these factors, we can say like, oh, these populations really didn't have heart disease. Like a lot of the factors we're looking at are indirect. Mm -hmm. the, the, yeah. And it, it gives us a direction, but it doesn't give us a clear enough point to make very strong arguments from, which is, that's the, I guess the biggest frustration. And also, so, and like, you can't really do it anymore. <laughs> So it would have been nice to like yeah. do the scans back initially, but right now, you know, you had the 12 lead EKG, which is not super strong evidence. It's a little bit, dis a bit disappointing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. One other area that it has actually been helpful though uh, for is looking at carbon take, you know, the couple of populations that have extremely high carbon take yet are incredibly insulin sensitive and uh, we can at least see that data clearly. Uh, but and they're not anyway, obese, yeah, right? it would be nice if... Right. Yeah, that that too. And also they, you know, seeing their responses to glucose tolerance tests and things like that and having their lab work. So those things are nice at least uh to have. But yeah, it would be nice if if we could have more of the data as you were describing. But anyway, that's why this is a, you know, something to take with a grain or grain of salt to whatever extent, but certainly does not provide evidence against any of the other things that we presented today or at least the things we we're presenting from our view that we're really suggesting uh that I would say there's no benefit to the consumption of omega-3s. And if anything, I would be quite concerned about their consumption. And I would argue that they would likely have some pretty negative effects. And uh, I think we made that pretty clear with the data that we went through. In addition to, in corroboration with the many mechanisms that we've cited uh, outside of this data in previous episodes as well. So I don't have too much else to add. I think we went through it quite a bit. Uh, hash through the details, hash through those studies. And so I, th I think it's pretty clear, but was there anything you want to add, Mike? I, I think my, the full takeaways, because the initial question here was, are omega-3 supplements or eating fish high in omega-3s like a benefit because we have, or worthwhile to pursue because we have studies showing that omega-3 uh, content of red blood cell phospholipids are associated with lower risks of, to of mortality on multiple levels. And I think it's safe to say that perhaps that relationship does exist. It doesn't seem to be driven by omega-3 consumption or high uh, by omega-3 consumption in general, even though mm -hmm. omega-3 consumption does modulate the omega-3 content of red blood cell phospholipids. So there's other mechanisms to explore there as far as, and we discussed some of those possible mechanisms as far as what is specifically leading to these higher omega-3 red blood cell contents um in these the it, overall like what is actually leading to that the mm -hmm. other thing is more studies would have to be exploring like are these associated like re reaffirming these specific associations perhaps done by people who don't own companies that do this type of testing or are involved in fish oil supplementation, you know, minimizing that, that bias component. So maybe having like a, a kind of a third party do that type of study without having funding from it. Uh, yeah. I, I think based on everything we went today, I or went through today and through these episodes, I certainly, um, a, as you came back to initially, which I think was a great point, the question was, based on this association data between omega-3s in the phospholipids and mortality and lifespan, should we be consuming omega-3s? Is that what, does that data support that? And largely, I think we would conclude, no, it does not. Based on those, re based on re that research, that, that is not enough to, to conclude any of that because there are so many confounding variables and because of all the evidence against it, all the evidence suggesting otherwise. So I think that's the most important takeaway here. As far as practical takeaways go, uh, I'm going to link back to episodes where we've talked through general recommendations for from the bioenergetic view on the diet side, which in which we talked specifically about fat intake, including PUFO, omega-3s. We talked about protein intake, we talked about seafood and fish. So I'll link back to that as far as our discussions on that front. And uh, yeah, we'll leave it there. Awesome. All right, that's going to do it for this series, exploring the relationship between omega-3s, mortality, and lifespan. If you did enjoy it, please leave a like or comment if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening elsewhere, please leave a review or five-star rating on iTunes. All of those things really do a lot to help support the podcast and are very much appreciated. To check out the show notes for today's episode, where you can take a look at the articles, studies, and anything else that we referenced throughout today's episode, you can head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast. And when it comes to creating a healthy diet, there's a lot of conflicting information out there. 
And that's why I've created the Energy Balance Food Guide to help you determine exactly what to eat to optimally support your metabolism and help you lose weight, improve your digestion, get amazing sleep, boost your energy, and so much more. The Energy Balance Food Guide is a one-page infographic that organizes foods on a spectrum based on how effectively they support your metabolism, and it also has a separate scale that adjusts this scale for you or the spectrum for you in the case that you're dealing with various digestive symptoms. This food guide makes it extremely easy to get started with a bioenergetic approach to optimizing your health, so head over to jfeldmanwellness.com guide to download your free Energy Balance Food Guide, and with that, I'll see you in the next episode.